We want to start off with a reminder that we are not doctors. Before you make any changes or try something new, always consult with your doctor and medical team first. Chronic illness can vary from patient to patient, so it's always best to consult with your own doctor for what is best for you. Hello, hello. Welcome to IB Determined. I'm your host, Michelle Harvey. And I'm also the host. I'm Mason Harvey. Today, we're going to be discussing two questions that we both get asked a lot. And we also see other people getting asked a lot. So we think these are important. So the first question is, is, what is it like to be a child living with an incurable disease like Crohn's disease? And what is it like to be the parent and the caregiver of a child with an, with an incurable disease? Right. So we'll be able to give you a perspective from both the patient and the, the caregiver. caregiver and parent yeah. <laughs> in my <laughs> case. So with some, not all caregivers are parents. Yeah. So um, so you can listen to this even if you are a friend of somebody with a disease, yeah. a family member. Uh, it can only help you better understand the person and maybe understand your own feelings, which you're feeling in all of it too. And I think it's important to first of all mention too that this is really personal information. And a lot of kids aren't willing to talk about their diagnosis. And some parents, I don't know how much they share but about it, yeah. yeah, we've always involved from the very beginning, we had the doctor include Mason, mm-hmm. you know, whether I don't know if that was always, you know, yeah. <laughs> exciting for you. Yeah. But my thought was, I would rather be honest up front and have him know there's no secrets. There's nothing yeah. hidden around the corner. We didn't tell him about something. So I thought it would also only help him as he got older to be an advocate for his own health and truly understand what was happening to his body. So. Thank you, Mason, for you. sharing. And we you want know, to spread the information. Yeah, yeah, we do. And I'm proud of how brave he is for talking about this. And we're only doing this because he is comfortable doing this. Obviously, if, if you know at any point he doesn't feel like he wanted to speak on something, that's okay too. And that's okay for if, if you're listening and you know you're a kid and you're like, I don't, I don't want to talk. Yeah, about it. <laughs> talk about it. Yeah. That's okay too. Yeah. Like it's you. it's all about yeah. what helps you heal. But it is good to find someone you can talk to. Yeah. Maybe you don't want to share it on a public platform. And you know, yeah. but, <laughs> that's, but that's just a little it is important for kids though to make sure they do have someone to talk to. And it yeah. could be your the parent, it could be the caregiver, it could be a therapist. Mm-hmm. But it is important to have that outlet for them, um, even with their doctors. Yeah. So That's all very important to consider in all of this. So let's, let's just jump into it and let's get started. We're going to start off with, um, what is Mason's diagnosis? You know, you all know he has Crohn's Crohn's disease. disease. So, you know, when we got to the hospital on June 10th of 2020, it was for a few tests to be run for Mason. Actually, the very first diagnosis he got was not. Crohn's disease. No, it wasn't. <laughs> when we first went in there, we were kind of taken by surprise because two days after we got there, they said he has a dilated aortic root. And very scary. Yeah. Yeah. It's and so very bad. The way they explained it to us is, you know, everything else that was going on with the heart was basically his heart could explode at any yeah. time, like an aneurysm. If it got to beating too fast, if his blood pressure got too high, if he got too stressed. Um, even so far as I said, they, he wouldn't be able to, they didn't want him running at, you know, just this, these are all things that are talking about in the future. Obviously in the hospital, he wasn't, no, I can't really run around with an IV in my heart. <laughs> no, but it was definitely horrifying. It was very scary. And he had always had a great heart, you yeah. know, at his well check the year before we were told, Hey, he's, his heart is strong and no issues. So it was like, what, like, what is going on? And and so it was very devastating because they told us it was irreversible. There was mm-hmm. no cure and they really didn't want to operate on something like that unless it came to that. And so they also said like the walls of your heart were thinner. Than, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Then that's what they were kind of, and then they wanted to do genetic testing and all this stuff. And it was pretty overwhelming two days in. Yeah. And that was right around the time too, he was getting blood transfusions because he was, you uh, know, anemic. Yeah, yeah. And he needed blood transfusions. Blood. So we went from thinking 
you know, we had a normal situation to just completely crashing. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Crashing <laughs> very quickly. And the reason this is important is because we had him on, he had to go on beta blockers, you know, that we lived like this for five months thinking yeah. he had this heart problem. We took him in to have another ultrasound done on the heart, you know, have like EKG and have mm-hmm. an echocardiogram, all that. And when they looked, they were like, it's, it's not there. It's, it's not there. It's, it's fine. Yeah. And we were like, what? You know, okay. Is this like, you know, is this a joke? What happened? What happened? Yeah. We, cause it's irreversible. Right. Yeah. And so we were, we, we were elated of course, but so many questions, you know? And so my thought was it could have had something to do with the Crohn's disease because of inflammation. Mm-hmm. I'm not a doctor. I, you know, no one ever had any know. answers. <laughs> no, but I think it's important to mention because if any of you get something like this, some kind of a diagnosis along with Crohn's disease, definitely worth following up with the cardiologist as quickly as possible. So seven days after that diagnosis came the diagnosis of Crohn's disease. Crohn's disease. Yeah. And we wrote a lot of this down. So you're going to see us again. Looking if you're down. watching us, we're looking down, trying to get everything right mm-hmm, here. Yeah. So this also, is, it's not the same for everybody. So if you're listening and saying, well, I have Crohn's disease and I didn't have that and I didn't have this, that's why this disease is so crazy. Because it's different for everyone. It is. It is. So you might have the same similarities, may have something totally different, you know, but this is Mason's experience. So I just want to make that very clear, clear that yeah. this is his. So um, what it was, it was, he was diagnosed with Crohn's disease of both the small and large intestine, intestine. and also pancreatitis. So his entire colon was inflamed as well. And I actually found out I had low bone density, which is scary because that means your bones could break easier than they should. Right. And there's concerns with growth too, yeah. because you were 11 years old at the time. And, and you so, should be growing at that time. Mm-hmm. They also found a spot on the spine when they did one of the MRIs and that was concerning. Um, there's other diseases that that could encompass, but they I just have, kept an eye yeah. on it. But that kind of went along with the joint pain, joint pain yeah. and the arthritis. So it was diagnosed as peripheral arthritis for him. He also had failure to grow because of the Crohn's disease, disease and the bio, the biologics. No, no that not would have been later with the steroids. The steroids yeah. kind of, that was a little bit later, but as far as your diagnosis, it was, and this is something common for kids. This is a failure to grow because you are malnourished yeah. because your intestines aren't behaving correctly. So even if you're eating and, and you're eating you everything you can, yeah. you're still not yeah. going to grow probably. Right. So it also was, showed up as anemia. Yeah. in him and then hepatomegaly which is a fatty enlarged liver liver so that was kind of scary as well mm-hmm. you know like what you know <laughs> <What is> that? <laughs> they can feel it and that's literally they can kind of push and they can feel yeah. what that is so that was the official diagnosis which is a lot it's also it's important to mention the disease is progressive yeah so that just means that it doesn't get better yeah. it, it, it can also change where what it infests too mm-hmm. for mason where they found it they found it in his and this is this is just so we know what their findings what they're looking for it's like inflammation ulcers and like polyps yeah so um and inflammation is a big part of that. <laughs> it is. yeah yeah i was like I see that. Thank you. I'm just going to walk yeah. out of the room. <laughs> Mason, when they try to show him the pictures My, of, it, I'm out. <laughs> of what it looked like inside, he was like, nope, nope, nope. 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 And Dr. B's like, you don't want to see? He's like, do you think I want to see that? <laughs> no, no. But um, but that's what they're, so that's kind of what they're seeing. Yeah. And so th- those manifestations were found in his esophagus, stomach, mm-hmm small intestine, large intestine, duodenum, ascending colon, transverse colon, descending colon, <laughs> and sigmoid colon. So it's, that's a list and a half. So he was, I mean, he was affected yeah. pretty much everywhere. So that's again, why treatments um, are very important for him were extremely yeah. important to jump on that, to, to keep it from progressing, causing more permanent damage for him. So that's kind of what his diagnosis was. And what happens next is with this diagnosis and for a lot of kids and adults, 
I think that there's like a whole bunch of like level of fears unlocked. Yeah. <laughs> so you have hundred more fears unlocked. Yeah, there's so many questions. There's like treatment options being thrown at you and just wrapping your mind around the fact that, oh, okay, there's this disease. There's another thing. <laughs> yeah. So for for Mason, so from the patient standpoint, and he wrote down, we have a few of these, so he yeah. didn't forget. Um, you can kind of discuss why some of these were fears for you. So one of the biggest fears I had um, in the hospitals, the doctor told me, Carlin's, you're going to have it forever. And I was like, okay, but what does remission mean? Remission means you're still getting treatments, but you're feeling better. Mm -hmm. And you're not symptomatic. Yeah. So the disease is still there. The the disease is still there, Mm -hmm. but you have to get treatments for the rest of your life, which sounded like the end of the world and well I mean at the time yeah yeah because I was scared of shots I did not like that that was the other fear you had a fear of injections and IVs I mean kind of who doesn't who doesn't I mean uh, then and the treatments also do have side effects too Mm -hmm. so yeah which we kind of mentioned the last one like when you watch the commercials and you're like Wow, it almost sounds like the cure is not helping. Is worse than, <laughs> but, it, it, it but it, I mean, that's that's they have to give you those side effects, so that is scary. But this is important to say: talk to your doctor. Yeah, I, I sound like the commercial, but talk, talk to, to your, your doctor, doctor. <laughs> and they can address those concerns and you don't want to make a decision because you're paralyzed by fear or by something you saw and 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 panic and use that emotion. You need to have a grounded in you know, science and talking to a doctor who can help guide you to make the best decision for your Your child child for you. you. And so, yeah, so that's just something. So yeah, it might be a fear, but definitely talk to a doctor and, you know, help get help with that. Don't just, (laughs) don't don't just not act and, you know, panic. So, so I was scared of treatments. I was scared of injections. I was also scared of being immunocompromised because you can't really go anywhere. You have to be very careful. You can go places, but you just have to be careful. Right. So it just changes a lot of uh, things that used to do before. Like it changes a lot. And then I was also scared of tests and procedures, which those are not fun no matter what they are. Because it's ongoing. Yeah. It's not just done a diagnosis. You know, you've had three sets of scopes in less than three years. And yeah, and that's out of the hospital. Right. And he'll be, he'll be due. He'll, he'll have to have them again because Yay. yeah, no, <laughs> I know. love knowing this. No, that's I wish it wasn't that way, but I mean, but again, it's a daunting thing. It's yeah. a fear of thinking this is all the time. You know, I know that's yeah. I mean, you got to do it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yep. And then I was also scared of flares because, and I, I, when I was in the hospital, I was thinking. If I get out of this flare, what's going to stop me from going into another flare? Because right. like the the treatments will help, but that doesn't make it exactly like it doesn't protect you exactly. And right. you can have like little flares and stuff, but I was afraid of big flares. Like right. I don't want to go back to the hospital. Because they had mentioned, because he was in the hospital for, we, we've said this, you know, almost two months. Yeah. That's a very long time. <laughs> very long. And so when we left, he was like, I I'm never no, want to come yeah. back. Like, and the nurse, and the nurse like, said, oh, you'll probably be back again. Yeah. Yeah, like, we see you guys, you know, you have to, and, and Mason's like, wait, no. So there's that fear of flaring. And, and then that would also mean your treatment the medication yeah the treatment isn't isn't working working. so that's a whole like yeah because then you have to change treatments you have to do all the stuff and so that's another fear on its own right um i was also afraid of surgery because that's another choice if treatments don't work Mm -hmm. and i don't i don't want to do that (laughs) and like we mentioned the surgery isn't a cure yeah it's not a cure it would depend what it's being done for there's many types there's ostomies there are strictures there's resectioning Mm -hmm. Uh, there's you know i could go on and on and there's different ways that they temporarily they can help Help, with one thing because it's necessary for your body to be healthy to process things so sometimes surgery is necessary because it sounds really scary when you Mm -hmm. do think about it depending what it is it might be something that really does make you feel better and is great for the long run so yeah 
And uh, the last fear I'm going to mention is doctors. Now, I, why would you be afraid of doctors? Well, I'm not really afraid of them, but you, I was nervous about what doctor I would get. And that's where I got lucky. I got to choose the doctor I wanted and the doctor I chose was really good. But I was afraid, like, depending on the doctor I got, um, I, I would be having surgery or maybe I'd be on different. Uh, right. Um, because there's no, like we're just saying, there's no necessarily one way to treatment. treat this. So yeah. one doctor, and, and that's where second and third opinions really are, are valuable. Yeah. Because if there's something that one doctor is saying, you know, or even if some, like, I've heard of, I've heard of things in the groups I belong to that are just like, I'm, I'm telling these people, please go get another opinion. And uh, your health is number one. You yeah. are number one. So if you feel that it's not being addressed as seriously as it should. Get a second or third opinion. And maybe switch doctors. But yeah. for Mason, it was scary because he just didn't know what to expect with this doctor. You know, because we... there were so many different doctors that would come in mm -hmm. and they're like, who's going to get chosen? Yeah, they were all good, but he would have yeah. like in the mornings, they when they did the rounds, he would have like, there were so many yeah. people they couldn't all fit in his room. <laughs> it was like sometimes there was like, I had, I had a big room. Yeah, yeah. And he did. He had a double room. But at the time, he was the only one in it because, because it was 2020. <laughs> yeah. And so the room would fill up and Mason being the center of it all in his bed, you know, and and there's doctors surrounding you. There's nurses surrounding you. Dating. Yeah. <laughs> and he just took it in stride. And I think that's really important to feel comfortable and take charge of your health by listening, and understanding your options. And I'm really proud again of him, how he handled <laughs> that, because it was intimidating as a, as a caregiver, a parent. I'm the center of the show. <laughs> yeah, but he handled it really well. And so like now to switch over to like the caregiver fears, you know, parent fears, like what comes into play? For me, the first one was his well-being. You know, I didn't like seeing him in pain. I didn't like seeing it's him hard stressed. for the people um that love you to see that uh, to see you in pain, which you can't control it, but it's the because they don't want to see you in pain. It's just very hard it is to see that stuff happening. And you kind of just feel like powerless and so because yeah, it's not like you can say crones stop hurting him right <laughs> you can't say that right so that was my fear was like how do I help him and not not see this stress like take mm -hmm. over and I and there's and for kids there's something called like child life specialists and this mm -hmm. is a pediatric hospitals I think they should have these at adult care yeah as well. <laughs> honestly they're phenomenal. So they come in and they're the ones that aren't going to do anything. So they're never going to come with a shot. They're mm -hmm. <laughs> nothing, nothing they that's going to hurt you. Just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> they help. Right. Right. So they're the ones who come I mean, in and they're they trained to, to help get kids, like get your mind onto something else. And while this procedure is being done or while they'll talk you through and talk about other things, they are fantastic. So I encourage you um, to reach out to a child life specialist and ask for one. They're really good. Help. Maybe before placing an IV yeah. or an injection or even on the way to a procedure, they'll walk down. They'll stay with your child where you can't. They can go back with them and hang out with them. So that made me feel a lot better because mm -hmm. my main, I wanted him to learn how to cope and feel kind of more, feel more empowered. And so my fear was him feeling like a loss of control and mm -hmm. just, you know, spiraling. And also, I think from my perspective, it was just accepting his diagnosis mm -hmm. because at first it's pretty unbelievable. And you're like, no way, this, this is my healthy kid, you this know, this is happening to my son. Yeah. And like, and how is there not a cure? Yeah. And how, what do you mean? So there's a level of acceptance you have to get to, and you also kind of have to go through grief. I, I think other people have mentioned this with other chronic illnesses and it's strange because you're grieving, like, I guess the life you thought you had mm -hmm. and you're kind of leaving that behind and accepting that that's no longer the plan. You this know? is the plan now. We have a new journey. And yeah. so you kind of grieve that old journey and you kind of have to do that, I think, to start to accept the new one and move forward. So I think that's an important part of the process. And Having those feelings and emotions are important. So that was kind of my other fear was just like, this is incurable. 
Mm-hmm. And what can I do to help him? And we'll get to that later because that's that's really important in the healing process as well. <laughs> um, also, what was scary to me, and I know their parents have voiced this, is that I couldn't see all the signs. What is scary is to think I might miss these symptoms. Mm-hmm. And if he's going to start to flare, I want to be on top yeah, you of it. Know. So my fear you don't want to let was, it get worse. Cause then you can go into the hospital and have all these issues, right? If it does get worse, it really can go fast. And so I was like, okay, you know, I remember being just extremely like hypervigilant on watching for signs because I just was afraid I would miss it. Mm-hmm. And I didn't want to miss it. So there's, and there's things you don't have to go overboard there's things you could do every day to kind of put your mind at ease and keep also your child aware. And adults can do this too. So we started kind of monitoring, we'd monitor his weight, food intake. Um, That's very important. Restroom. Yeah. Oh yeah. Usage. So yeah, but it was, it was all important and we would document things because you forget over yeah. time, like you kind of, it's easy. So I don't want to forget anything. So I wanted, yeah. I wanted to make a show to the doctor and say, you know, here, take a look at this you know, here's how he's doing. And so that was, that was kind of how I eased that fear was by monitoring and, uh, and slowly time helps too. Hmm. start to feel more confident, I think. And just the, the unknown was a giant fear. Like, yeah, not knowing like what's going to happen is very scary. Right. It's not like anyone could say, well, in, in a week, he's going to feel like this or two. It's, it's just like, you, you don't, don't know, know, you have to go along with it. Everyone has hopes that it's the best case scenario. Like that's fantastic. That's what they want, but we still don't, there's, there's, it's not predictable. And so that, that really threw me that mm-hmm. for him, I'm going, what's his future gonna going be like? to be yeah. like, and what about work and, you know, all these things. So, so it's like this, like I said, whole level of fears are unlocked <laughs> and you are as a parent. I mean, I think every parent has like, normal concerns. So, um, so yeah, so, I mean, those are some of probably, we were trying to think of more common ones that we probably shared with other people. So hopefully, you know, I, we didn't get to all of everything on that, but, you know, just kind of touched upon some that you might relate to and might understand yourselves as well. And the diagnosis really was life-changing. Yeah. And I mean, we one moment you didn't know what you had. The next moment you have Crohn's, mm-hmm. and it's <laughs> and it's for the rest of your life, right? And like, so we'll go from the patient side again. You know, some of those life changes, like especially for a kid, because I think people are curious. You know, like what it's like, and it's going to vary because every kid does different things. Yeah. So, um, I'll let you kind of yeah. So the first one, um, because I'm on two biologics. I go to the hospital every two weeks. Because you might be thinking that's not how mine is. No, that's not how mine is. But for us, it, it it's every yeah. two weeks and that's between infusion and, and injection. injection. So yeah, and that's and that's hard, I think. Yeah. It's a long day. You have to drive down, you have to wait, you have to get the shot, you have to come back home. And so then sometimes some people get yeah. worse side effects from them. So some people I get like a little headache mm-hmm. and that's usually all, but yeah. for other people, they, they can get other, some things. people, they, they say they get highly, they're fatigued for days, you know, it, that isn't fun. And, but for Mason, we also pre-med, so mm-hmm. we can talk about that more in a biologic yeah. discussion. Yeah. We'll take that, but, but that's something else we do to, to give him the best chance of feeling well after these treatments. and. It wasn't even, you had to go a lot more than every two weeks. So oh yeah, um, that's beginning. just for those treatments. For there's, the treatments, it's every two There's weeks. all the other appointments. So he had, you know, for him, it was it's like. The beginning is like almost like three times or more a week. It was, yeah. Five, we were, seven <laughs> every day. Yeah. So many tests and specialists and yeah. close monitoring. So it still is where we're at three years later, mm-hmm. we're still at the hospital every two weeks. Um, yeah. It's a long <laughs> time. but you adjust. Yeah. That's something you, you do get used to. But at first, yeah, that was definitely like the hard part. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And the next one is school. Now I'm lucky because before I uh, found out I had Crohn's, I was homeschooled, which is good because I'm still homeschooled. <laughs> right. But it's so, nice because I can go to the bathroom if I need. I can 
uh, I, we do my schedule. Right. Right. So basically yeah. the same things you might do at school, but on your own schedule yeah. that works for you. Because if you're like at the school and you're, and you have Crohn's, like maybe you can't go to the bathroom exactly when you need you. It's distracting. Uh, the, some of the food, at uh, schools mm-hmm. aren't the best for Crohn's disease. My, some yeah. people have trigger foods and something, you know, you might have to be very careful and so there's and the and sometimes you may not be comfortable yes and you that might not be having a good day mason was sometimes he couldn't sit up yeah it was, i'd be sitting on the couch and it'd still be a little annoying mm-hmm. so we would we were fortunate enough to be able yeah. to accommodate that and he was able to stay on track and he's a year ahead yeah so <laughs> yeah which Woo. is fantastic most a lot of kids, this can be, it can be quite devastating because yeah. their school can take quite a hit with the hospitalizations, the appointments. Because sometimes so, uh, for some appointments, like I said, it can take almost a whole day. Right. And then you miss the whole day of school. Then you have to catch up. And then that the yeah. next day of school is then kind of messed up. you just have sick days yeah. because, you're, you know, and if you're immunocompromised, that's a whole another set of problems. That That's why also for us, homeschool was very good because you might go good. to school, you might get sick more often. Which that would and we'll happen. cover this more because this is actually a really important topic. And so there's IEPs and 504 plans you can do to accommodate for your child and advocate for them and schools. We're going to make that into another episode because that is a really important topic to discuss and hopefully bring on some guests that can share their personal experiences with you guys. So we will not forget about that. We will go further with that. Yeah. Uh, the next is side effects. And these are caused by different medications, which include like um, pills Mm -hmm. or the treatments. Right. Like when you're taking like Mason was on prednisone Prednisone. and methotrexate. Yeah. It gave me bigger cheeks. (laughs) Yeah. So moon face. That's what it's called. Which is tough for some kids and adults too. So the way your appearance changes and you can get stretch marks too, because yeah. you gain weight so quickly in certain areas, you develop stretch marks yeah. and it's, it's tough and people don't always know looking at you. And you, these kids don't have to explain to everybody like, this is what's going on, but it's yeah. uh so yeah, his and with prednisone and methotrexate, I lost a little bit of hair too. Your hair was yeah. falling out. And so in the hospital, when they started methotrexate, I mean, I don't know if that's, I mean, he's also had the malnutrition from Crohn's, but, yeah, that, but that this was, was it was around the same time he started that his hair would fall out mm-hmm. with clumps. And so we would find it on the pillow and it was like, oh, okay. And then my hair going? actually all changed colors. Too. It did. It did. Yeah. It actually, it changed colors and <laughs> it was very strange. when you started the biologics. So, yeah. and with it, so I think that whatever kind of scary yeah yeah and i and i think people who've been through chemotherapy have experienced yeah, this definitely. as well so it kind of changes things from the inside so yeah, yeah so his hair started it went from a blonder to a darker color like there was a line it was immediate yeah. it was like you could actually see it like yeah. it wasn't like a little fade you, no. you could see just a, a line yeah. Like you can see it. Yeah. And then it was like it started to get a to- much thicker. And yeah. So so anyways, that was interesting. But it was, that was much, that was great because we were thrilled um, that you because some people experience hair loss uh, for quite a while. Yeah. It's very difficult for them. And so that can be also hard for kids on, and adults. I was on for pregnancy for about a year almost. Probably a year and a half. Yeah. yeah so they considered yeah. you dependent on it. So you have to wean off of it and that takes quite a while yeah so that's a whole nother discussion (laughs) we have a lot of fun things to discuss are you excited for next episode (laughs) we keep telling you all these exciting things we're gonna talk about in the future this and this and this and this (laughs) so yay stay tuned yeah (laughs) and uh so vacations oh yeah i can't go on vacations almost every summer we go on a little vacation for about two weeks you say little a little. <laughs> they were a big. Trips. Yeah, it's actually like, a big vacation. I love and those. And we actually uh, learn so a little much. bit while we're on them. We Oregon did. Oregon Trail, all that stuff. We would take whatever he was learning about at the time and we would turn Go it into them. like an adventure and we would visit all those places like living history. Like and Yellowstone. Yeah. We yeah. got national park. He would get his junior ranger badges. Um, we love national parks. They're really fun. I miss it. And 
it's not that it, the, the hard part is getting their places to stay yeah. and making sure Mason's well enough. We only have a certain amount of time in between appointments, so yeah. we can't do any big trips. And a lot of people travel with this. so Or you just do a shorter it trip. Just, again, it looks different for a lot of things. Everything. Yeah. So for us, vacations are tough. And that's something that we definitely will get back to yeah. and enjoy. Hopefully soon. <laughs> mm-hmm. But that was definitely hard to adjust to. And the next one was getting a therapist, mm-hmm. which the therapist we have is very good. Yeah. Best therapist. It's And so that's something like, like what Mason said. He yeah. likes her and he's like, she's great. Yeah, he she's had, a good therapist. He had other psychologists, psychiatrists yeah. um, he, in the hospital. Yeah. And he was like. They, too, they feel like they're too straightforward almost. Like they're personally, too you call busy. them robots. Yeah, robots. Sorry, sorry, watching. Sorry, I'm sorry. You know, it's, it's so <laughs> I know. Um, I guess the takeaway from that for me is that sometimes I hear parents like, Oh, my my child does not want to talk to a therapist, or they talked to one, they didn't, it didn't go anywhere. I think that means you don't have the right yeah. therapist. Find a Find a therapist that works for yeah. you. Because we really had to convince Mason. We're like, no, tr- a therapy is good. We need to do this. And he was kind of like, no, no. <laughs> Why? You know, I'm like, just trust us. So we found you know, our our therapist and she's fantastic. And he talks yeah. to her, um, you know, just like you would, I think, a family member. Yeah. You're very she open treats with us her. like a family member. Yeah. So Mason feels like he can talk to her about anything. And I think yeah. that's important from it's very important, even a caregiving standpoint. Um, it helps us to know that there's somebody else. Like if maybe he felt comfortable saying something to somebody else, for some reason, we've, we've got mm-hmm. all those bases covered. So we know that he's being looked after for his yeah. mental health as well. So that's very important. So if your child doesn't want to go, or you're an adult who's like, I don't like it. Um, <laughs> I would say, cons- I would say, talk to your doctor, consider it and consider a therapist and like interview them don't like if you meet up with one like don't think they're all like that you know there's different personalities and find one that you're comfortable with yeah Mm -hmm. and so mine so for me as a caregiver i guess it's it's my turn now (laughs) it's your turn i passed you the mic yeah how it changed how it changed my life as a parent is that you know i we i had thought we had it, like a pretty normal, happy life, you know, no real serious concerns. No. And then to have this like cloud that suddenly felt like it was like looming over us, it was very hard. Very hard. Yeah. Very difficult. And I also, like we kind of mentioned before, I didn't want to see Mason frustrated and no. and kind of give up or think that life is you know it's like i knew it could still be wonderful and to find the bright side of everything the bright side of crohn's disease yeah well also still acknowledging you're gonna have good days you're gonna have bad days and that's okay and never never making him feel like he couldn't come to us and just you know hey today is you know i i'm upset about this roller coasters uh because diseases are like roller coasters and we occasionally have loops, we have flat parts, and we have hills. Yeah. And whoop de doops. <laughs> yeah. And you just you don't know what's coming. Yeah. So that kind of adventure. That kind of frustration. And that was a little difficult at first. And also from a caregiving standpoint, parent is insurance fights. And if that's fun. Yeah, <laughs> no, I'm not. sure you're listening and all of you are like, yes. Oh my gosh. I know all of you have experienced this. I don't think there's a single one of you who has not had to fight for just your, what your, you yeah. need to survive and it shouldn't it shouldn't be like that and that's something we're very passionate about why we speak out too because we want to bring awareness to this and i've i've learned a lot and it it's unfortunately usually learned when you're in the middle of something bad so yeah when you're denied a treatment or you're you know denied if you don't have that treatment you might go no seizure you're denied yeah. a medication whatever it might be it usually feels crucial at that mm-hmm. time. It doesn't just happen. And you're like, well, I have months so we can fight this. <laughs> it's like, one. I have to, I, you have no choice. Yeah. So that's really something that we'll talk about another episode, because I think that's important to important. cover. We want to help other parents and help other caregivers with whatever knowledge we've learned. It's important to share that with each other so we can help each other out. 
Yeah. And also the scheduling of all the appointments. We have a schedule book. Yes, we um, do. Yeah, I know they have apps for it, but we have like an old school like but, scheduling book. So all of us can see it. It's something that sits out by our table. We have all of our appointments mm-hmm. scheduled in there. And we also have my chart, which is great. A lot of hospitals have that. And so yeah. that's organized online. So you really don't miss appointments. It's it, you have a we have a good system. Our hospital is a good system, but just scheduling all of them and is is difficult. Yeah. And that kind of leads into with work. And work is really tough to figure out. And I don't have a lot of answers for that. Yeah. I know for me, I'm self-employed. I run my own business and it was still a challenge because just because I'm home running a business doesn't mean I'm like doing nothing, you know. Yeah. So and my husband is employed with a corporation, you know, he goes to work every day. And so it kind of left it on me. Mm-hmm. And usually I think it does fall more on one parent unless both of you can, you know, work it out. But stay so, home somehow. Yeah. So luckily in our situation, and my husband's extremely helpful. He takes yeah. off, you know, your dad's Wednesday so good. And... Well, he has his days off. That's when we try to schedule appointments. Yeah. And he also will call in to help whenever if, mm-hmm. if I need to go do to an appointment. He will, we try to stay, balance yeah. it. So but it's tough. It's, it is. I don't think a lot of people realize, you know, you only have to run a vacation time, sick days. It's not like you can be like, I need to take this week off because he's not feeling good. Right. You only have a certain amount. <laughs> right. And it's so like we're going to just help. We're going to discuss that because there's things like FMLA and things that we did. We can discuss more in another episode to help parents also kind of navigate that. But it's tough no matter what. Um, It's very hard. Yeah. And then for Mason, we would like to, like, we'd like to monitor, like, with this activity. Yeah, it sounds, yeah. it sounds like he's being, like, watched. watched? Yeah. <laughs> but we try to do as normal as possible. Mm-hmm. So kind of like we mentioned before, he takes a lot of his own control of this as well. So it's not like Wait, us having yeah. to constantly say, Mason, how, you know, how are you feeling? Mason, what did, you know, so we monitor things like he does his weight. We have supplemental drinks. You know how many of those he drinks a day. We okay. also have a journal that he keeps in the restroom to document. To How still... many times I right. get it. <laughs> And if there's any abnormalities, it's yeah. written Anomalies. down. And we also used to do a food log. Luckily for him, um, we did this to find triggers, but he yeah. does really well. These biologics for him, he really doesn't have any triggers. Yeah. So, but we, for a long time, we, we had, had a food do log it. and every meal, every drink, every single thing that went in was written down. down so yeah. that way, if he was like, had a reaction we could we can see look if... back and be like this is what caused it mm-hmm. so oh. yeah <laughs> it, and that was really that was really helpful for us but that is also something else mm-hmm. that changes because you really have to monitor these things before that you were not necessarily as concerned with but now it is a concern yeah and i think something that's very normal for parents and i see this and i think they feel bad for it is i don't want to say it's envy but yeah. it's it's you're happy for other seeing other families yeah. do normal things like go on vacations or um just do normal stuff but there's that sense where it's like i'll see other parents say i'm just having a bad day i saw a bunch of pictures posted of friends doing you know they're at disneyland or they're wherever they're at and you look at it and you're like oh i'm happy that they're doing this good right but then you think why can't it be me? <laughs> yeah. And there's, so there's a frustration there because it's not like this is not something where you have like a two-year treatment, a three-year treatment, a one-year, there's no, it, it's just ongoing mm-hmm. and you going it, and going. Right. So you just really embrace, if you're feeling good and you're do stuff, embrace yeah. it and, you know, j- just try to live your life because it's, you never know when things can take a turn again. And so we just, you know, we're a little different situation of being immunosuppressed, but we try to enjoy every minute and celebrate all of the little joys, you know, all of the happy moments yeah. and, um, and try and, and just, and, and just know like we are, it's so, yeah. So it's a weird feeling. you think for parents conflicting where you're happy for others, but you feel kind of like forgotten, mm-hmm. like you're kind of, you're not part of that world anymore. So it's a hard it's a hard thing. It is. And um, you also can, there's also, which again, this is, it's kind of difficult because 
you watch other kids heal who have other, you know, chronic illnesses. And there's some you also see that are never going to heal. And um, so it's, it's difficult. You feel for those kids that their lives are forever changed. And it's like, you can wish it is so different for them and you wish they're like the other kids who, you know, become cured or can move on from chronic illness. And, um, but what we found is instead of focusing on like wishing that could happen is, you know, like with Mason, we figured out like you heal through helping others. We found other ways to, to kind of help that feeling of wanting all kids to have a fantastic childhood. You want all kids to have a healthy, happy, normal childhood. So we're really big on speaking out and doing this too. And raising awareness for kids and kids and crumbs, <laughs> kids with crumbs or ulcerative colitis yeah. or, or really any chronic illness. So it's just something very close to our hearts. Yeah. And we want to help. Yeah. You see a lot of these kids in the hospitals and you're just like, wow, you guys are warriors. You're mm-hmm. amazing. And yeah, the I, caregivers are too, that are yeah. right next to them. Cause I remember when we uh, first went to the hospital or we yeah. walking in and I remember I was walking uh, to our room and there's just so many people uh kids in the bed yeah and it's like wow I, I never knew this right. is what happens in here and it's scary it's sad because yeah, yeah well, it was all so new to us people. at the time yeah. and now we're getting more used to seeing yeah now we're getting that. more used Unfortunately, to it Unfortunately, yeah. it's like Ooh. it's but it just it I think it's given us another set of eyes to see this world with and to realize like how can we help others and you know let let other kids be seen mm-hmm. and be heard and give them these voices and so hopefully that's kind of what this podcast will do too you know it's yeah. not just about Crohn's disease and uh, so yeah so that's hard you want to like save everybody <laughs> I think you, you save them yeah it's yeah. um it can be really tough you don't want anyone to be in pain no yeah no so that's kind of a you know, you see some kids that get better and that's awesome. Yeah. And then you Congratulations. see the other ones that are suffering kind yeah. of and so, like, hmm, yeah, I want to help. <laughs> I want to help somehow. So that's what we're doing. That's exactly yeah. why we're doing what we're doing. We have other plans to, um, you know, in the future to hopefully also empower kids yeah. because I think like for Mason finding ways to give him back control over something so uncontrollable was really important. Yeah. And I think, you know, he's, he's been involved in so many different aspects of, and he's been welcomed into these, into a lot of businesses, corporate, you know, it's been a really cool experience for him to feel like he can see hope for the future mm-hmm. and he can see, you know, potential for other treatments that are being worked on. And that's the that's really cool part. You can see <laughs> treatments being made. It's history. Right. It's history being made. It is. And hopefully within, you know, it'll definitely be within your time. And yeah. hopefully within a lot of the adults and stuff listening, because it's hard for them in so many other ways. And those that's like another discussion too. But you're all doing a great job. Yeah. And, you, you know, you that's just, funny. you need to find what, makes you tick like Mm -hmm. what what is your passion and and get involved I really encourage yeah I I know caregiving (laughs) I mean you already have work it's all time job job. (laughs) but I think that there is something in it where you get onto the other side of it and it really is healing yeah so I think that's important I think it is yeah it's important so that kind of wraps up this today's video. episode. Episode, video. Yeah. Well, some are listening, yeah. some are watching. So if you are watching and you're on YouTube, I recommend you like and subscribe. Yes. So like and subscribe would be great. You know, or, it will help r- with awareness. Yeah. Give us, <laughs> if, and, and we're enjoying a couple of you have left some comments yeah. and messaged us. If you have a comment. Please uh, keep it up. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And unless you're it's someone who's like, not really nice, yeah. um, <laughs> just message me. <laughs> don't leave a comment. <laughs> you know, we don't need harassment. Yeah. So um, try to bring some positivity, guys. Yeah. Let's keep it positive. So 
But yeah, feel free to put any questions or any recommendations for something you'd like us to speak about. And we, we, you know, a part of this, actually, I want to mention support groups really quick. Those are super important too for mm-hmm. caregivers and patients. There's a lot online, like on Facebook, there's some great support groups and, you know, reach out to them as well yeah. for, you know, there, sometimes you may not feel like you, you, you want to talk to a therapist yet or, you know, but their support groups are great for other people to understand and who can be encouraging as well. Mm-hmm. It can be a little scary too not going to lie, you know, some of the stuff you read about, but it's all part of the bigger picture and learning about this disease and helping others and helping them with their fears. So, um, yeah, yeah. I think that's about Great it. Job. Thank you yeah. for listening Thank and you for tuning in. Yeah. And we will be back with our next episode and can't wait to see you guys again. Yeah. See you next time. Bye. Bye. We hope you will stick around, tune in, and reach out to us with your own journeys. We are excited to give you an inside view of what it takes to be a caregiver and what it's like to be a patient. And most of all, we hope you'll maybe be able to play something you hear on here that might help you in your own life. Sometimes life changes, and it's all about how you handle the journey.